All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Navigating Data Privacy and Cybersecurity during COVID-19, sponsored by Hunter McLean, as well as Sterling Seacrest Partners, Infinity, and yours truly, Advertising Specialty, Diana Morrison. To just give you an idea, a little bit more of who we have here today, I'd like to do some brief introductions. And I will start with Ryan Sewell at um, Sterling Seacrest Partners. Ryan has been in the industry for 15 years in property and casualty and the brokerage field. He holds the designation, he holds the designation of Chartered Property Casualty Underwriter. That's a mouthful, that's a mouthful, Ryan. Um, he's played a key role in helping multiple businesses with their cyber liability coverage. And we're going to hear from Ryan today a little more about that. We also have from Hunter McLean, we have Nicole Pope, um, associate. Her practice focuses on privacy and data security, as well as technology translations, transactions, sorry, such as outsourcing and software as a service licensing. Nicole also advises her clients on managing their intellectual property, including filing and pursuing trademarks and copyrights. And then we have Chuck Brown from Infinity. And Chuck is the founder and CEO. Uh, he's also a best-selling co-author of the book, Cyber Security. Chuck has over 30 years of experience in computer network support and IT consulting. He believes the key to developing effective tech technology solutions is understanding how a company functions and where it wants to go. So a couple of housekeeping items today. Um, there is a chat function for questions. Um, we did have one early question today that we are going to incorporate into our discussions. Um, so here we go uh, to start our panel questions. I am Diana Morrison, business owner, advertising specialty, and I can't say how thrilled I am to have this information because as a business owner, it is vital for success. So if you're a business owner or a manager, please take some good notes because one of the main things I always feel like when you give your time for something like this is that you walk away with something you can use today in your business at least one thing, but my goal would be three. So to get us kicked off today, Chuck, I'm gonna ask you to start. Um, you know, your company, I'm sure, being a major resource um, for many years and during this pandemic, um, you noted in our initial conversations um, leading up to this webinar that the rapid development of a remote workforce has led to companies implementing solutions that have not completely vetted for security concerns. Could you kind of start us off with that? Sure. Thank you, Diana. Prior to COVID, companies kind of fell into one of three categories. On one end, they had fully embraced remote workers, had well thought out standards for deployment, and they found the remote workplace was a desirable feature for them. Um, the other extreme were companies that allowed very little or no remote access at all. Uh, if they had it, it was generally the owner getting in to look at their accounting or something like that. Mm -hmm. The rest were companies that really didn't have a well-defined policy, but generally allowed some remote workforce occasionally. Once companies started to understand the implications of COVID, the requests for remote capabilities came very quickly, especially to our company. Keeping the company open was much more on their minds than security was. Unfortunately, this often meant implementing remote access for home computers. Uh, while technically this often works with no problem at all, home computers not under some type of standards and management are often not updated with security patches. They don't have current, current antivirus. And if they do have antivirus, it's whatever came on the machine or freeware that the owner found somewhere. So you can effectively open a tunnel between a very vulnerable home workstation and your nice secure network back at the office. Companies often have policies about what you can and can't do on equipment they own to lower the risk of a security breach, but it's really hard to have those kind of policies about what you can and can't do when the, when the employee owns a computer themselves. So these are the kind of things that have to be thought about and considered and it often haven't been taken into account. Thank you, Chuck. That's, uh some really good examples. Um, 
Anything else you want to add about what you tell your clients um, about security policies and how they uh, set up their remote working environment? Uh, well, the most important thing in all of this is, is clear communications. Have a policy, even if it's not perfect, have some type of standard that you adhere to. Tell your employees what the expectations are. There are ways to make these environments secure, and the best thing you can do is sit down with your IT support company, whomever that might be, explain what you're trying to accomplish, um, and, and working alongside, again, with the guys we have on the panel today, talk, you know, talking to your insurance people, talk to your legal counsel about what you can and can't do, what your exposures are, what the risks are involved in, in the things you're trying to accomplish. That's great, Chuck. That's a great tie-in to Ryan and how this ties into cyber liability policies. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Diana. You know, I think if there's one takeaway that I have listening to Chuck, it's it's to plan, you know, and, and you know, in, in the context of what we do every day, you know, sure, you can go out and buy a quick little cyber liability policy. And don't get me wrong, that's better than not having anything at all. But um, we really believe in a course in a full planned out risk management process. You know, you, you got to plan to be proactive. You also have to plan for the for the inevitable response of, you know, if something happens, what are you going to do? So, you know, we all hate applications. Uh, a big part of that risk management process on the front end is to get with your IT professional, get with a potential insurance company and, you know, fill out a long form application. Um, I, I think it's important so you can properly evaluate, you know, what your exposures actually are. Um, and then maybe even get with an insurance company that can do a full forensic analysis for you. And once you've done that, you have the ability to identify what your exposures are, quantify what your exposures are, and then you can decide what are we going to eliminate, what are we going to absorb as far as what are we going to self-insure, and then what are we going to transfer. And that's all part of the proactive process. And so once you identify what you're going to transfer as far as the insurance contract, then you can really start structuring your cyber liability program around that. You know, whether you need to get more robust on the liability and the breach response or the, or the liability and the regulatory side, or you need to be more robust on the breach response side, or maybe you need to be more robust on the operational security and the crime insurance side. These are all the buckets that you can buy on a standard cyber liability policy, but they're not necessarily one size fits all. So we definitely <laughs> suggest that, you know, you spend some time really trying to figure out what your exposure is. And, um, and that's only step one, because then I think very important as part of being proactive is that step two, which is building out your bench. You've got to prepare for the response so that when something happens, you're calling a Nicole, you're calling a Chuck, you're calling another forensic um, analyst of some sort that can help you jump on and address these situations very quickly and um, keep, keep them from you know, turning into something a lot more than what they really need to be. So for us, it's all about preparation. And, and of course, as a part of that, a cyber, li cyber liability policy is a great vehicle to protect yourself corporately. That's a great counsel, Ryan. Um, thank you, because those are really, really proactive ways that we can all protect ourselves. And thank you very much for being the person that you are that doesn't just say, sure, I can sell you a, a liability policy and not asking enough good questions because we know that you do offer amazing counsel to your clients. So they have the perfect, perfect application for them to protect them. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so Nicole, from a legal perspective, um, what are a few practical considerations that a business can do to address the risk and the IT concerns? Absolutely. Um, I actually have three I'll hit on today. So the first, and this is something that we're seeing a lot of insurance companies inquire about, is review your website or your application privacy policy. Um, take a look at it. We recommend reviewing it on an annual basis, but now more than ever, it's really important to take a look at it. Are you collecting different information? Are you storing it somewhere else? Who has access to the information? Who are you sharing uh, the data with? You need to think about all of those things because the legal requirements are that your policy needs to accurately describe how you're accessing, sharing, um, and dealing with data. So, so that's the first thing. The second is you really want to do some due diligence on your vendors, right? So now you might have to hire Chuck's company to help you um, outsource your IT needs because you have workforce working from home. So Chuck, we know is great. We love Infinity. Um, but you want to ask them, you know, how do, how do you track our data? Who's going to have access? Where's my data going to be stored? 
in the past, have you had security issues? If you have, how have you dealt with them? Um, these are the types of things you want to ask all vendors, anyone who has access to your information, because it's so integral. Your security chain is only as strong as the weakest link in it. So it's not just a lot of times companies think about employees, but it's also your downstream vendors and their subcontractors as well. And then thirdly, take a look at those contracts. Um, what we're seeing more and more now is uh, a simple order form that you'll get from a company, you know, stating the pricing terms and, and a description of the service, and it'll actually link to the master legal term. So you'll just get a one page or two page uh, document that you sign off on. But if you click the link, it takes you to a 10 to 15 page legal document that actually describes the terms that will be enforceable uh, once you agree to that order form. So it's important to take a look at them, see, see what you're agreeing to, uh, understand how that company is gonna be accessing your data and utilizing it. Um, will your data be anonymized? Will your customer data be anonymized? So just some things to think about. Um, and then, you know, just think about exactly what you're getting and describe it in the contract. So sometimes, you know, we're so quick to try to move along that we don't take a deep enough dive. Well, if there's an issue down the road and you want to claim breach of contract, it's so much easier if you have a clear description. Um, and sometimes what we'll do is add what we call an ancillary services provision, which is kind of a catch-all provision that helps protect you in that circumstance. So it basically says, we're not just agreeing to what, what's stated here, but anything that's required for these services will also be inc uh, included in our contract oh, and in our pricing as well. So those are the, the three things I would say. That's awesome. You know, I think we're all guilty of not wanting to read those long contracts. And even if we did read them, I don't know why we, I don't know that any of us would really understand them. So. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for always being there to read those and help us understand them. Is there, just to dig a little bit deeper, is there any one singular law to look into that addresses data, pro data privacy or security issues? Is there any one thing that we as laymen can chime into and help us understand more? I wish that the answer to that question was yes, <laughs> but unfortunately privacy law in the United States is very patchwork. So um, for example, data breach laws are, are done on a state by state basis. So, you, and you're gonna wanna look at the states whose individual, the data whose individuals were um, breached. You have to look at each state for that. So it can get pretty confusing. The good news is best practices, you look at the most restrictive state's law and you follow that um, in a large data breach. But you know, each law has different requirements for time frame for notification for what exactly has to be in the notification, um, for who you have to notify, is it the individu individuals, is there a certain threshold of individuals whose data was breached that require notification? Um, even the definition of breach can vary greatly. So it's really important to understand the, the legal landscape. Um, but then once you understand the data breach laws, then you have to look at industry specific laws. So if you're in healthcare, you know about HIPAA and high tech, um, you, need, you need to make sure that you have business associate agreements in place with your vendors um, for the transfer of PHI and, and make sure that you're gonna be able to comply um, with the requirements of HIPAA. And then most recently, we're seeing more overarching data privacy laws that are industry specific, aren't specific to data breach, um, but that are, are happening in a more global sense. So we've seen this in the EU a few years ago. Everyone's talking about the general data protection regulation because there's really extensive fines, up to $22 million. Um, and people say, oh, well, it's okay, that's in Europe. No, if you're accessing or collecting data from European citizens, then you could have to comply with it. Um, similarly, in California, wow. um, I know it's overwhelming, <laughs> uh, but in California, they passed a new law that went into effect this year called the California Consumer Protection Act. Um, enforcement actions could begin July 1 of this year during the COVID pandemic. Um, and interestingly enough, the regulations were just finalized last Friday, and they are now in, in effect. Um, but this law is, is much broader than what we've seen in the U.S. So the definition of personal information, it's not just your social security number or your health information. It's anything that can define an individual or a household. So that's pretty broad. It could be geolocation data. It could be biometric data. So you really want to kind of understand um, the scope of that of that law. And, and it also gives consumers a, a much greater rights than they had previously. So not just the right to know what information companies 
are obtaining from you, but they have the right to have their information deleted, which as you can imagine would be quite difficult um, the way information is traveling and being used now. So understanding the complex um, structure is really important. And then um, once you know that, you can work towards compliance. Wow. <laughs> There is an awful lot of information in that head <laughs> of yours. So um, if we can switch back to you, Chuck. So tell us a little bit about how what Nicole just talked about ties in with compliance policies for IT. And, you know, for example, HIPAA um, that we've talked about a little while ago. But if you and Ryan maybe could tag team on that a little bit? Sure. Um, HIPAA is a very broad set of regulations. There's only, you know, some of it applies to IT, but there's a lot more than just IT in that. To be compliant, you have to take steps within your technology to protect data. That's, that's simple enough. But you also have to deal with the human side of it. For example, if you'll be ex accessing protected health information, your monitor has to be positioned in such a way that it can't be viewed by someone who shouldn't have access to it. As a company, it's, it's very hard to enforce such a standard on people working out of their homes. It's hard to tell them they have, you know, you're, unless you're going to go to their house and see how their monitor is positioned, if they're pulling up that type of data, there are issues with that. Um, for paper that might have to be destroyed, in the office, it's pretty simple. You have a bin, a secure box that's picked up by third party and shredded. In a home, you lose those controls. So these are the areas where, A, you need to have uh, legal resources talking to you about exactly what the requirements are on you. And then you also need to have insurance resources to make sure that if you do screw up and you do have a breach, that you're covered. Wow. Yeah, I, and I, I, to Chuck's point, I would add to that, it's not, um, and Nicole hit on this too, it, it really is so industry specific how each of these in, individual data cybersecurity laws apply to you. And that's why we say, I mean, I'm not going to you know, disparage anybody that goes out and buys a cyber liability policy and it's kind of cookie cutter and it's there because it, it absolutely is, is better than, you know, not having anything at all. But, you know, a lot of your stock standard cybersecurity policies will, will come with fifty dollars to $100,000 of fines and regulation penalties. And, um, you know, as Nicole said, fines and regulations can be tremendously more than fifty dollars or $100,000 if you are actually in an industry that's processing or collecting, you um, um, private data or, um, you know, so I think it's important that as you go through again, that application process and you're working with your attorney and you're working with your, you know, IT professional that you're saying, Hey, I'm a restaurant or I'm a hotel or I'm a medical facility. What exactly is my worst case scenario? How many records do I have? If I have a breach and the breach is over 500 records, my notification costs alone are going to be X number of dollars. And then if I was found to be at fault, I can have liability on top of having fines and penalties from a PCI or a HIPAA. So, you know, these, these claims are oftentimes, um, you know, one thing we hear about a lot, especially in the retail space is, oh, well, we don't collect data. We just, we just process it, but ultimately we're just the middle party and a vendor on the outside. And, and, you know, that's all well and good. But at the end of the day, if you are the point of sale, you still owe a, burden, you still owe a responsibility for notification and potentially even for liability if something should happen. And, you know, if you've got several thousand records, I mean, that can be extensive by the time you buy the identity theft coverage, the notification costs, and then that's not even speaking about liability. So, you know, each one of these laws is so elaborate and so extensive in and of itself. It's really important to see which little piece of that you fit into um, and then build a plan around that. I feel like my eyes have been opened today. Um, one of the things that kind of stick in my brain is we keep talking about industries and, and Ryan, you just touched on it, like the medical industry for HIPAA and this. So the average Joe business owner like me who prints logos on products, I have some liability as well as the world gets flatter and we do business all over the world. Nicole, you mentioned something about Europe a little while ago that as the world gets flatter and, and we do business everywhere, um, it, it seems like that, that there's some different liabilities as it relates to different businesses, as it relates to different countries, as it relates to different states. And 
I, I don't know if any of you have any insight on that or if it's just a question in my head, but I think if we're talking to the average business owner here today and not someone just in the medical field or not someone who is just taking a credit card payment, that type of data, is there any other type of data that we don't instantly think about or we're in denial that, oh, well, that's not going to happen to us because all we do is this. Is there anything that any of you would like to add? Diane, it's, it's not really a technology answer. However, I, I think you're right. I think people, and it's not even as the world gets flatter, just don't really realize how many regulations there are. Um, most people run credit cards through a third party, but there are still companies, especially smaller ones, that if you hand them a credit card and their credit card machine is not working, they write down your information somewhere. <clears throat> there are compliance issues with that. If you have an employee that gets sick with COVID and you come in the next day and you say, Joe's out sick with COVID, there's regulations about that. There's, there's regulations about who you, what you can say, who you can say it to. And even though we're, especially in the businesses we're in, we're used to being a small business and we don't think about things like that. We think of ourselves more as a family atmosphere. We can talk to each other. In some cases, no, we can't. There's, there's just a lot of things that, not because of international regulations, but just because of regulations, period, we, we need to be aware of what we can and can't do legally. And one thing I'll add to that, too, is, you know, everyone thinks about the regulatory bodies, you know, the Attorney General, HHS, as being the enforcing mechanism. Well, one thing that's interesting about some of these new privacy laws, like CCPA, there's actually a private right of action. So individuals can bring lawsuits for your failure to have security mechanisms in place for your data breach if there was some sort of fault involved, or sometimes not, you know. So it's important to understand that this is coming from different angles as well. Yeah, wow. and, and I mean, if, if you have any identifiable information or you're taking payment of any kind, you know, from an insurance perspective, it's not a one size fit all program. And, and frankly, you may, you can't insure all of your risks. So there's some risks that you're just natural, but Nicole hit on something very early on that I really, really think it's critical to look at your upstream and downstream contracts, really be sure that you understand that if you're accepting an exposure, maybe you don't want to insure for it, um, that that you know where your potential pitfalls rest. And, you know, it's probably worth a little bit of time and a little bit of money to talk to a Nicole, to talk to a Chuck and, and find out, you know, what exactly is out there for you that you're not thinking about because they see it every single day. Absolutely. So audience is, as we start to uh, wrap up here in the next couple of minutes, if you have questions for anyone or for the entire panel, please remember that there is a chat feature, um, which leads me right back to you, Chuck. Um, you know, we all talk about um, monitoring your employees' security, but also their productivity. Um, can you touch a little bit on, I know you did a minute ago, but could you touch a little bit on regarding maybe the... Sure. Um, we've had several requests for software to monitor both security and productivity. Um, software applications like this have a range of capabilities, anything from just monitoring the site someone goes to, to actually the amount of time they spend doing certain things, the number of keystrokes they type in, even potentially accessing the computer camera and the desktop. In the office on company owned computers, there, there are still legal issues with that, but they're, they're less. I mean, you own the equipment, the employees on your time, that's one one set of legal issues. However, when you're working with an individual's private computer in their private home, um, the legal landscape becomes a lot more complicated about what you really can and can't do, especially without their, their knowledge and, and acceptance of that. Um, before we ever do something like this, we always recommend a client speak with qualified counsel so they really understand if they're on safe ground in, in, in what they're doing. And we also, strongly suggest considering, and this, this gets more to meddling in the management realm, um, but consider measuring an employee's output rather than specifically what they're doing. There are tools for that. There's a lot of tools to, just to, to look at what they're doing, metrics to set as far as productivity goes, so that you don't really have to care about how they're spending their time, which you care about what that produces. That's great. I, you know, I think we're all living in the um, more flexible work schedules today, especially as children are being educated from home and parents don't have a place for them to go, um, that 
productivity is key. When they do it, maybe not so much um, in some industries. Um, so just, Nicole, is there a way we can shift the risk involved with IT contracts? You, I know you touched on this a little while ago, but anything else you want to add? Absolutely. I think the, probably one of the most important is your indemnification provision. You're definitely going to want to negotiate that because typically when you uh, contract with the vendor, you're going to get their form and it's probably going to have, if any, very limited indemnification provisions. Um, so you're going to want to be able to shift the risk if there is a breach or if that vendor doesn't follow the data security requirements that you put in place. Um, you want to be able to shift the risk to that indemnification provision. So take a, take a close look at that. Um, that's a place that gets heavily negotiated. Another uh, is termination provisions. You know, quite often, you know, we'd love to ask for a termination for convenience, you know, to get out of the contract at any time for any reason. Um, but unfortunately, in economic times like these, you know, a lot of vendors want to have that revenue source uh, to be able to project their revenue ahead of time. So they won't agree to termination for convenience, um, but they will agree to a termination for cause. So what we recommend is defining what mm -hmm. for cause means. So define it as a, a, a data breach event with a certain number of individuals, you know, a failure to follow ah. the policies, a failure to follow your DR policies. You know, these types of things um, can really help you out if you get into a pickle down the road. And then um, the other thing I'll say is look at the limitation of liability section. Quite often, there will be a 12 month direct cap on damages, which, um, you know, a few years back, we might have been able to negotiate unlimited liability, but now the risks are so great. There's so many new laws that, that come into play here that most vendors are just not willing to accept that. So what we uh, are usually able to negotiate is what we call a super cap. So it's a multiple. So if you have a direct damage cap saying that the vendor will only be liable for 12 months prior fees, then for a data breach or a privacy issue, you might say, okay, well, for those, we'll have four times that cap. So 48 months, that type of thing. So, you know, again, it's important to negotiate these. The larger the deal, the more money you're spending, the larger we can usually negotiate the cap there. I'm glad we have professionals like you guys in our area that we can depend on as business owners and managers. So Ryan, back to you for a second um, as we wrap up. Uh, strong checks and balances that ensure the output and desired results. Any thoughts there? Yeah, you know, I, mean, I think I, I've always loved the old cliche of, you know, you have to inspect what you expect. And I, I think organizationally, you know, Chuck hit on it. You, you got to find a way to measure the output. And, and I think one of the very first key components of that is establishing what those measurables and what that expected output is. And it sounds very, very mm -hmm. simple. Um, but I think we, one thing we're all learning is just how much um, unintended feedback you got when you're running to the, you know, running to get a cup of coffee or you're, you know, taking a five minute break. It gives you an opportunity when we were all in the office place together to get an idea of what was going on, who was doing what, where somebody may have needed help, what could have been bogging somebody down. But when we're, when we're at home in a remote setting, you don't get that instantaneous feedback anymore. So it's, it's really important to establish I think, you know, um, mechanisms and parameters to communicate more often. We, we all hate Zoom, by the way, I feel like, but it, it really, with an opportunity, you know, Microsoft Teams or Zoom or whatever it is, you have to find a way to stay connected and you have to establish those measurables and what that specific output is that you're looking for so that you can, frankly, hold people accountable, but also help continue to move people further along their career. Um, specific to IT, you know, um, it drives me crazy, but I see the value in it. Our, our, our IT department is constantly sending us, you know, sample social engineering emails, sample phishing emails, you know, trying to constantly trick and deceive us internally in, in a very, you know, benevolent way so that we don't get caught up when it's, when it's real. You know, you really need to make sure that you're getting your employees used to seeing the dangerous emails because um, we've seen so many instances of cyber fraud and cyber crime where somebody clicked on the wrong email or somebody had their email cloned. And that is, that sure is a legitimate email asking me to send money down to Miami. And I swear to you, you would never think you would do it, but it happens so easily and so quickly. So really making sure that you've got very intentional processes in place to constantly inspect what you expect, both from an IT standpoint, but also just from a general, general work life standpoint. Mm -hmm. 
That's great. That leads me into something that I know that is very, very important to Sterling Seacrest, and that is company culture. Could you talk a little bit about how you maintain it and the importance of it? Ryan, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's hard, right? No, it's hard, yeah. Um, I mean, maintaining culture is both critical and challenging at the, at the same time, but I think it's not only critical from a corporate morale standpoint, Point. I think it's critical from a personal well-being, personal welfare standpoint. Um, so we've just tried again to be, um, you know, small coffee chats to having small happy hours, to having big happy hours, to doing Sterling Seacrest Partners bingo, which is somehow tied to a fun fact or a fun quizzical piece about somebody, to doing, you know. Um, Sterling Seacrest trivia, you know, whatever it is that we can create the opportunity to all come together, see each other, albeit remote, but think is it something we're doing internally. You know, we do Tuesday afternoon boot camp classes, we do Thursday yoga, you know, just socially distanced, but anything that you can do to try to create some, some um, time together. Uh, and then externally, you know, we're trying to be really intentional about partnering with some of our key partners here in Savannah, you know, doing ground bagging with Second Harvest, uh, doing a couple of Red Cross blood drives here in the parking lot, um, you know, raising money to be intentional to get us back to our roots of the things we really care about, which is taking mm -hmm. care of each other, taking care of our clients, and then taking care of our community. So, um, you know, all those things that you did so easily, again, when you were all here together and an idea came up, you've got to be really, really, really intentional about making sure that it happens and that you effectuate it. And, you know, I think we've done pretty well at it. I'm sure we could do a little bit better, but, you know, we're, we're staying connected and that's an important thing to us. Wow, that's great. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so, so wrapping up here, remember we have uh, chat available if you have questions. So Nicole, my last thought for you is, um, are you seeing any particular types of technology starting to emerge? Absolutely. Uh, a couple of things come to mind actually. So one, obviously at the beginning of the pandemic, given the nature, we saw a lot of, we're seeing a lot of telemedicine. Um, and so it's interesting because the Department of Health and Human Services had to act quickly uh, to provide guidance to determine um, how healthcare providers could still comply with HIPAA while providing medical services across platforms mm -hmm. like these. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one thing that comes to mind. Another is artificial intelligence. We're seeing that just boom in, in numerous industries. You know, um, there's a Canadian company that was actually able to predict what we now know as the COVID-19 pandemic nine days ahead of the World Health Organization based on tracking wow. flight data, um, tracking, um, you know, airport data. I mean, it's just, it's crazy the type of information that they're able to put together and then, and then populate these types of things. So we're also seeing it in South Korea, nine out of 10 South Koreans are actually getting notifications now um, about, you know, that they might've been exposed to coronavirus. So there's all different types of technology. Some industries are using chatbots. So to deal with customer service needs, they'll have someone, um, you know, a, a computer basically, rather than an individual, respond to people's questions about billing. They can be available, the computer's available 24 seven, so it's very helpful. And then, you know, an example that comes to mind personally is I've been ordering out and, and ordering curbside a lot for restaurants. So that application that those restaurants are using can, can be used to track the analytics to help um, forecasting and, and to help with supply chain needs. So it's really been all over the place. And it's so interesting to see how this is playing into all different businesses now. Thank you, Nicole. Chuck, the last question is for you before we uh, discuss just briefly that one question that we had early on. Um, do you see any new trends in technology, um, not just softwares like um, Nicole was just talking about, but any new trends in technologies and that are really proving helpful to the business owner and manager? Um, for for the client base that we have, for the for this environment, 
Um, not so much new, but more important. The collaboration tools um, that are being used today are so much better than they used to be. You know, we're we're in a world where Microsoft 365 is the big platform people go to for collaboration for their office and teams and things like that. So the team platforms come to mind for that. Uh, people are used to Zoom, as Ryan mentioned, everyone hates these things, but Zoom, WebEx, um, you know, they're, they're being so heavily used now to keep our teams together. We, we have regular teams meeting and make use of Slack as well. Um, hosted phone systems, all of these things that are more cloud-based rather than premise-based are, are becoming more and more and more popular. And they were anyway, but the whole pandemic and people working from home has accelerated that in pretty much every front. It's made them more susceptible to hackers because people are using them more. It's made them more important to companies continuing to function. There's, there are tons of web-based tools to keep, help your team uh, mentally stay close together, to keep in touch with each other, um, and again, as Ryan mentioned, you know, having, having happy hours together, just doing things together that people miss doing is so important for the health of the team long-term. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, the, the, the downsides to having to work remotely, but honestly, from an analytics perspective, in a way it might be better because we, we were used, to, a lot of companies were used to, you know, you get up, you walk around, you see if your people are working. If they seem like they're busy, they must be busy getting the job done. It's forcing a lot of companies to take another look at that and go, how do I really analyze what they're doing? I can't see them now, they're somewhere else. So I don't know if they're really working all day or if they're working four hours and playing golf four hours, I don't know what they're doing. So maybe I need another way to analyze the output of what they're doing which is really a much healthier way than walking around. So all of those types of tools, the analytics tools, the communication tool, the collaboration tools, those are all becoming much more important than they ever were before for most of us. Some companies were using them heavily already, but, but most small to medium sized companies weren't. Um, the only last thought I, I would leave everyone with is just the importance of planning. And you know, to each one of the experts on here today, um, that, that's what we do. That's the most important thing we do is help you plan. You, you, you know, the most important time to speak to an insurance company, the most important time to speak to an attorney is before you have a problem, not after you have a problem. The same is true with IT. You know, when you, when you call up the help desk and you've never talked to an IT company before, you've hobbled it all together yourself and your network is down and you can't work and your people can't work, that's really not a good time to call us. I mean, I'd rather you call us than not, but that's not the time to do it. The time to do it is to prevent that from ever happening. And that's true for each one of these industries. You need a, you need a well thought out plan and you just need to start somewhere. If you do nothing but make a list of the things that could happen and what you're gonna do if they do, it's a starting point. And an incident response plan that says, when something happens to my company, what am I gonna do and what is my staff gonna do? Um, those types of plans are tremendously important to keeping your company alive. Okay, so I, I want to address this um, this one question that we had come in, which uh, I'm going to try to make it as simple as my brain can understand, because <laughs> uh, it's a little industry specific. Um, it's talking about um, Personal, personal health information, PHI, um, from two perspectives, the employer self-funded medical insurance and the sharing of PHI between two separate medical providers on different electronic medical record platforms. Whew, that was a mouthful. Um, and then the other is uh, ensuring employee privacy by limiting employer access to PHI. HIPAA regulations, and the other is the inefficiency in the medical community of sharing critical health information between two health providers that disrupts continuity of care in a patient. Anybody want to tackle any pieces of those or have me repeat it maybe <laughs> one at a time? I can start, Diana. On the employee side, you know, I think it goes back to some of the things that Chuck and Ryan talked about. It's important to limit access to PHI to individuals who, on a need-to-know basis. Um, you know, it's important to think about making sure that you have the, appropriate, uh, the appropriate privacy policies in place and that you train your workforce to understand uh, how they can comply with HIPAA. And then, you know, at Hunter McLean, we have a very robust employment group and ERISA attorney that are more than happy to answer specific questions on, on that front. 
Um, and then on the EMR side, you know, we see this a lot with our clients and I think it just reiterates the importance of testing and understanding um, what the capabilities of the technology really are that you're signing up for. So um, we actually require uh, the vendors to agree to a certain level of testing in the contract and to really understand um, how many levels of testing are gonna need to happen mm -hmm. because it's not just integrating into your uh, IT system, but it's also your other vendors IT systems as well. And so you have to kind of look at it as a package deal. That's, that's great information. That helped me understand that a little bit more. Thank you. Not being a, a healthcare professional, um, Chuck, Ryan, either one have anything to say? I, I would, I would just piggyback on Nicole. I mean, you, you got to make sure from the, an employer self-funded standpoint, for example, if you're sharing information around that it's, it is specifically to those people who need to know, you know, Chuck mentioned a brief example earlier of somebody comes in and says, oh, I had COVID. Just a simple discussion around people's health circumstances could absolutely be grounds for, um, you know, dissemination of information to people that it, it shouldn't be. So um, just making sure that you treat every individual conversation and every uh, personally identifiable record and health specific information with the care, custody, and control that it, it deserves and it warrants um, is just good risk management practices around how to around how to converse around that. Understood. Chuck, anything? Yeah, one thing I would add, Nicole mentioned about the inter interaction between systems for healthcare. Um, and this is true for all companies, and it's never been more important. You know, there was a time when if you needed an application and you had enough money, you'd have it written to do what you wanted it to do. It was a single application stood by itself. And then we moved to large applications that were more boxed applications that were sold by a salesperson. He would come in, meet with you, talk about what all you did and make sure things work together. Well, now we're in the cloud world. So you can find an application you can rent that will do anything, anywhere for anybody. Um, but what those applications don't really care about is what else you do. So your EMR application may or may not work with correctly with, say, your faxing application. Almost everyone who has cloud apps connects them to some things. Healthcare is really big that way. Logistics is very big that way. There are a number of systems um, connecting to, you know, if you have a logistics system, if you're in shipping, you may connect on the back end to a FedEx or a UPS or any number of places. The interoperability of these systems is extremely important to the business functioning period but privacy raises the bar on this because now it's not just a matter of you not working today, it's a matter of you getting sued tomorrow. Because if one mm -hmm. system happens to pass the wrong information off to another system that doesn't protect it the way you thought it would, you're liable for it. So again, it becomes even more important to thoroughly test and vet these systems and make sure that all the vendors you're working with know who all the other vendors you're working with are and operate and will put in writing what how they protect the data being passed back into. Got you. Thank you. We do have an additional question that's come in. It says, what is the name of the company that pre predicts info? Yeah, I think that was for me. So the Canadian company is called Blue Dot uh, and they actually specialize in this type of analytics and and um, they pride themselves because they actually were already contracting with the Canadian government. And so that this has been published in a number of large publications. You can look it up, but it's just, it's been fascinating to me, but the company is Blue Dot. Blue Dot. Thank you for that information. I'm sure Google will allow us to find that contact if we need it. <laughs> um, so I, one of the things that I would say today is I've learned a lot um, and again, I am very grateful to live in an area that we have professionals that I can look at face to face who know who my business is and can help me carve out a plan. But one of the things that I have heard consistently from all three of you is you have to have a plan. And if you don't have a plan, you're going to fail, just like any other business function. If you don't have a plan for your revenue stream you don't have a plan of operations and production, well, security is no different. And it's one that you have to, add, have, to have, and you have to add that to your business plan of security. Um, whatever that security is, from a legal standpoint, from a technology standpoint, from an insurance standpoint, 
and I'm sure there are others, but those are the three that we have speaking to us today. So thank you all. I have learned a lot. Um, I think we also understand that being safe and having a plan and spending a little bit of money up front is a lot more profitable than paying for it in the end. So unless we have um, other questions, um, we will have, so this is being recorded, so you know, and each one of you that have um, signed up will get a recording of it and it will have the contact information for all of the panelists that you have seen today. And that way, if you have questions or interest in their services, you know how to uh, reach them directly. And I think that's unless we have some more questions or unless our panelists have um, more information they would like to share with us. I think we're signing off and we appreciate very much your attention. And again, I hope you have one thing you left here with at minimum that you can go into your business today and utilize. Thank you very much from our sponsors, Hunter McLean, Infinity, Sterling Seacrest Partners, and me at Ad Specialty. Thanks so much, everyone.